listening to Kendrick Lamar's <laughs> Butterfly, for me, it's given me the same insights and richness that does for me a few strands. It's easier, someone once said, to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. But it's clear that what we can make systems of this complexity, cultural systems, economic systems, machines of this complexity, surely we can make a world that could first meet those needs I described that everyone should have, and then perhaps meet needs that people have only dreamed of, like the need for some autonomy and free autonomy. The need for that little space up there, the eye part, to expand a little bit. Just a little. Just a little. Just a little. The so -so socialism that could engage with the yearnings and dreamings and Miles Davis music. An aesthetic dimension. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Acid Left podcast. This is Adam Ray Adkins, and today I have Artin Salimi with me. Artin Salimi creates YouTube videos that go beyond the familiar video essay by strongly embracing elements of hip hop, experimental music, and multimedia collage. His videos are a unique experience not only in their sound and look, but also by the angle they approach many topics. Two birds having a debate or conversation on topics such as Marxism, Islamic thinkers, psychoanalysis, mysticism, and theories of masculinity. Artin was one of the creators we predicted to gain more attention on our Twitch stream at the beginning of the year. And I'm happy to say I think that's coming true. Artin, I wanted to thank you for coming on, but also ask if there's anything else you wanted to kind of fill in about your bio or talk about any of the other work you do besides your music and videos on YouTube. Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me on. And thank you to anyone who's tuning in right now. I think you've given a more than generous description of my work. Um, yeah, let's get the show started. All right. Um, well, I wanted to ask about music right away. Uh, the thing that kind of like instantly drew me into your work was how strong the music component was integrated into the videos. You know, it's not just beats behind as a soundtrack or a score. Uh, it's really kind of a music piece first. Um, and Mike and I, we first started working together on something similar. I was making kind of like more sample based music, uh, more vaporwave than hip hop. Um, and so when I came across your stuff, I really like it resonated with me and I was like, this is even better than what I was trying to do. Um, so uh, what prompted you to start creating like that kind of work? Was there something that drew you to that over a traditional essay? So there was a 12th century poet called Attar and he was a Sufi and he has a poem called The Conference of the Birds. And it's essentially a journey of 30 birds trying to find the one. Uh, and this one, uh, this master is called the Seymour, which is a legendary bird from Iranian folklore. And being a very clever poet that Attar was, if you split the word Seymour, you literally get 30 birds. And so it's kind of a play on words, meaning, you know, the birds realize that they themselves are the Seymour and this whole time, uh, they were searching for themselves and one searches ultimately a search for oneself and that kind of thing always really blows my mind but more than that that kind of poetry that kind of lyricism it sticks it stays with you and it's not just in your mind but it's in your heart as well and with this channel is two birds trying to find the meaning of life over hip-hop so that's the general description and it's trying to blend these two words um these worlds which um aren't separate at all you know listening to Kendrick Lamar's to pimp a butterfly for me is giving me the same insights and richness that thus spoke Zarathustra has and I've always wanted to put out music but in terms of YouTube philosophy I always thought there was the space for creation um, and I decided to kind of tap into that and there still is a lot of space for creation so whoever's listening if you have an idea and uh, for a channel or whatever, please, please do it. Don't be afraid. 
I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a lot of room there of all different varieties for people to create. So that's great to know where that, where the birds come from too. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right the way that it does stick in your heart, not just your mind. That's really important for us. And it kind of speaks to your work too, not being purely, obviously you're a smart guy and it's like, you know, based in philosophy and academic study, but there's also a good element of heart and spirit involved there, um, which is, I think, quite often missing from a lot of, uh, you know, the radical left ideas that are presented online. And we're starting to see a reemergence of that. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy with that. And yeah, uh, well, we, we've talked a lot uh, or a little bit offline um, about, you know, the thriving hip hop scene that in Iran and how it's kind of entwined with a radical and socially conscious view of society. I was pretty much unaware of that. Like I, I remember watching like a Vice video, I think a couple of years ago about metal in Iran, um, you know, but it's something that just isn't quite covered much at all, either in like mainstream American press, but even in like music press or like indie press, things that you're, if I'm reading um, hip hop blogs, I've from, you know, the States or from the UK, it's very rare to kind of see any coverage from that. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of like expand for the audience a little bit of the history and context. Um, I mean, frankly, like I said, me as well, like how important do you think all of that is and how important uh, in general is art and music for political and social movements together? So, um, I'm going to answer backwards if, if that's cool. So um, if, with regards to how important music in general is for political and social movements, um, I'll give a quick context as to how my first experience of hip hop in general ever, ever, ever. So I was in Iran, I was nine years old and I was on a school bus. And I'd never listened to hip hop before, ever, ever, ever. And this was because my family weren't really that musical. No one played an instrument. Um, there wasn't that kind of culture around. And my friend who was sitting next to me had a Walkman. And on the Walkman, he said, hey, do you want to give a listen? And I put it in my ear, and it was 50 cent piggy bank, right? And the hook, if for anyone who, who remembers, it goes, Clink, 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 clank, clink, 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 clank. The money goes into my piggy bank. And I remember, I don't know, my English is terrible, but I knew what piggy bank was. And I was like, oh my God, this guy is making the sound of coins going into something and rhyming it with that word itself. And then you have this. And that was it. My mind was forever blown from that moment on. Is that like, and none of us knew what the hell he was talking about. Nobody knew what 50 Cent at the time was, but we knew it was the best thing ever. And I think that is, I, I think going on to what, on the importance of it is precisely this idea that uh, there tends to be this philosophizing on content. The content has to be amazing. The content has to, but what draws people in is the form. In, in, and again, this is quite a form versus content is a massive philosophical debate, but I personally, I'm a person who um, believes in form and uh, someone like Immortal Technique, for example, people are like, oh yeah, you know, his content is political, it drives influence really good. But for me, it's the opposite. It's the fact that he's a battle rapper and he's basically battle rapping the government. You <laughs> know, he's battle rapping imperialism. But, and that, that, that form of battle rap of like trying to belittle, trying to embarrass, trying to like use very uh, interesting metaphors, similes, puns to bring out a lot of these social factors is the thing itself. The content comes afterwards. The content is what sticks essentially, but the form is what introduces people to, to it. And so I think in general, a lot of art is a gateway to great content. It's a gateway to great philosophy. It's a great way to great, uh, 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 great movements. So definitely, I think um, I think it has a great importance there. And the first Iranian hip hop song I ever listened to 
and that I'm aware existed. Probably wrong about that. There must have been some really help before this, but it was around 2004, and it was a cassette um, called Eskenos, which means cash um, or a, like a note, and um, it was by Shahkar Binesh Paju, um, and it was this satirical the whole concept was a satirical view of money and how that it's this axis upon which everything spins so it's like where's your house what car you drive that's the thing that really matters but it was in a very tongue-in-cheek kind of tone and um this was it, it was it, it went quite big people were like oh my god people there's there's lyricism here there was no puns there wasn't any metaphors there wasn't any similes nothing it was simply rhyming words on a 90 BPM beat, basically. Then came 2006. And 2006 was when the album um, Janyal Asphalt, which translates as Asphalt Jungle, came out. And Asphalt Jungle was from an Iranian rapper by the name of Hichkes. And Hichkes, quite uh, kind of in, in the realms of mysticism, uh, it means not the literal translation is nothing or nobody. So heech is nothing, cast means nobody. So it's a, it's a nobody. And the producer was a man by the name of Mahdiar Abajani, who was 17 at the time. And the entire album is the first time that Iranian, traditional Iranian instrumentation is being merged with hip hop beats. And it is absolutely mind-blowing and for me anyway it was the first time that reality just kind of split in a way because you, you you're, you're seeing something that's usually associated from outside of the region being blended in with your traditional instruments what you with what you would hear at weddings or what you know uh, some villager would play and that's mixed in with dubstep absolutely insane this completely uh, mind-bending and um the that's accompanied so a lot of the tracks on the album are accompanied by the iranian british rapper reveal um who's absolutely phenomenal please everyone do check him out um and he even says in one of the first songs of the album my people came together to work as one like 30 birds forming the sea mob right so he even references that um and he's again for me one of the beyond just the, the we, we talk about form but the content of the album he's talking about social issues he's talking about poverty oppression exploitation really hard-hitting stuff but things that everyone's aware of you know no one who hears hip-hop that's talking about poverty and these these kinds of issues is ever unaware that these things are going on it's just that it can become saturated you know that these things are going on you know that there are issues in the world but the musical element adds another angle to it it inspires something in people it causes people to see things in a completely new way and the fact that it's with language and the fact that we're through these kinds of melodies and through these kinds of forms even me who was um, 12 at the time heard these things suddenly it stuck differently it's it, it really really struck differently for me and from there it was really that right now it's a as in throughout time it's kind of developed into a massive movement so Persian hip-hop absolutely it's absolutely massive and I would also like to pronounce my own ignorance towards the rest of the world and other genres there's Korean jazz there's you know Russian uh, dubstep there's all sorts in anything that one would think exists probably exists in the realm of music, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, wow. I have a lot of thoughts there. Um, I think you're right. Yeah. It, there is like, you know, those types of genres in everything. They're all out there proliferated. Um, and I think it's important for audiences to recognize that and explore some of that stuff mm -hmm. because it does give you a much richer um, understanding of cultures that aren't your own um, and you know all over I think we tend to try to typecast cultures into certain little blocks when of course they are rich and uh, multi-diverse and I actually really like listening to a lot of music um, with 
languages that I don't understand because yeah. it allows me to appreciate the rhythm, um, especially like vocal rhythms and inflections. You know, there's a lot to be said there that can be lost when you know what they're saying. <laughs> so it, it is, it's really good for you. Um, and if you're like a musician yourself, for that reason too, to kind of hear other things. And yeah, when you hear like a, a Persian melody with, you know, the bass and snare from a hip hop song, that's a beautiful sound. Uh, you really get to appreciate the melodies in a different way too. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, I really, go ahead. I was gonna say, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> English hip hop songs I wish I didn't know English for while listening to other songs. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah that's that's actually a really good point um sometimes i feel the same way uh <laughs> uh you know I, i i thought that was really interesting the way you said that about immortal technique though uh that's someone i listened to i listened to a lot when i was younger it was one of uh the first like consciously political right, right. hip-hop that i had heard and yeah thinking of him you're right as a battle rapper with the state with um imperialism or capitalism as the other person there is that's a really great framing mechanism for him because it is so overly aggressive um Absolutely. yeah you know Absolutely. yeah i i want to quote i want to quote some lines but i feel like i probably shouldn't um yeah do it dude as an and, and again on 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 the point of immortal i think i think one of the things that's really cool is when he goes off on someone So when he begins just going away from politics and being like, screw this person, he does it so artistically. It's yeah. like, you know, like, uh, and you realize, oh, this is where it comes from. Like, this is where. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. So I'm thinking of the way that he sometimes will bring politics into a diss. So it sounds like, you know, it's it starts off like maybe it's a diss towards a person and you're mm -hmm. just an abstract person but you know i think in the line where he says i kill you and take your land like an israeli expansion yeah. like fuck um i remember the first time hearing that line and being like dude that's too much that, <laughs> that got me you know that's i mean i was probably like 19 at the time and i was just like that's i <laughs> i don't know if i can handle that um but it's poignant and it makes the point and it okay. connects it you know someone listening to this aggressive rap that might not know anything about, you know, um, occupation and Israeli settlements and stuff like that, that might prompt them to look into that as well and see that there's something terrible going on there. Uh, obviously, right now, that's very much the case. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure music is an important uh, aspect of uh, of what's going on on the ground there right now, giving people solace, giving them the will to fight um, and so on. Absolutely, absolutely. And spreading information as well. We have, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Low Key. Low Key is one of the main artists that speaks about uh, uh, these issues in his music. And he has, a, uh, he has a song called Long Live Palestine. And I remember, um, again, being like 13, 14 or something like that. And the song really affected me. And again, I knew as a 13 year old what's going on in Palestine, but his music kind of added that element where it just kind of opens your heart up a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, so moving on a little bit and I've kind of, we've said this multiple times already. Uh, I think it's really fair to say that in America and probably the West in general, we're taught very little, um, mostly nothing about Islamic culture or thought. Um, and we're exposed to it like by trends filtered through modern conservative Christian views and like post 9-11 reaction, all as if it's a, a political movement and stuff like that and a very narrow political movement. Um, or we're given like this whitewashed Uh, version with figures like Rumi. And you talked about that in your video about Edward Said and Orientalism, uh, where he's like kind of turned in from an Islamic thinker into like this vague new age spiritualist. Um, and so I was wondering if you could kind of expand and give some of the Islamic thinkers that you think Western thought should engage with, like what would be the most fruitful there. Um, and 
like especially for Western leftists and radicals and like what they could learn from those ideas, you know, beyond simply getting past cultural bigotry and xenophobia and Eurocentricism, which is important, but what in the ideas themselves is there? Mm. Um, well, I think that's a really great question, particularly with reference to ensuring that what it is that you're reading about the, you know, uh, about Muslims and stuff, there is a, um, you know, who is filtering that? Because if you're reading a translation and you're looking at the credentials of the person translating this, it can tell you a lot about the agenda behind the translation. Um, I myself translate sometimes, and I I can very much see the meaning of the lot that's lost between languages. It's almost impossible to hold on, basically, to uh, particularly with respect to poetry or lyricism. A lot of meaning is lost, but the translator has that power. And I think um, for your audience listening. If there is someone that you wish to read, always ensure to read the translator and who they are and what they're about, what their politics is before um, taking the translation as in, in, at face value. I think that's important. Um, with regards to thinkers, um, I would mostly say Shari, uh, Ali Shariati and um, Jalal Ala Ahmad. And the reason I'm picking these two thinkers is because they were um, both Iranian thinkers who encountered Marxism. And they very much um, were influenced. And when they came back to Iran, they saw the state uh, of the, uh, the land, which was, you know, ruled by monarchy. Um, you know, you had Pepsi and Coca-Cola adverts everywhere. You had uh, uh, your oil was being uh, taken and you were uh, essentially a puppet state. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the emphases for them was to merge these two traditions where you had Islamic thinking on the one hand with leftist radicalism. And they kind of very critical of the kind of priestly types who only lecture in mosques and don't actually protest or do anything in terms of politics and were very much pro-activism, pro-radicalism, new ways of thinking, new ways of being. And so those two writers, I think, would be interesting, interesting for people who want to see how that's navigated. How do you navigate Marxism, which is very atheistic kind of materialist perspective on the world and how Muslims kind of use that to navigate the world and uh, push towards social justice. So I definitely think those two thinkers would be um, interesting. But um, yeah, it's again, it's a very, it's, these kinds of things are incredibly difficult because there's a tendency to make a lot of Western thought the default um, and orientalizing the other. So. Um, uh, when we talk about like Simone de Beauvoir, for example, we just say philosopher, you know, we don't, uh, or Heidegger or Nietzsche, for example, the, the, the thinker is the thing that sticks in our minds, whereas there's a tendency to kind of call anything outside of that as this type of thinker or that type of thinker. But in reality, it's just people who think deeply about things in various contexts. and. Um, I th I'm optimistic about, I hope to be optimistic, which is optimism, and optimism about the future and in a, in a way that um, there is just people who think essentially people are not pigeonholed into certain orientalist notions of exoticism or kind of uh, spiritualism and all these kinds of things, but people can navigate their own realms. Yeah, I think, um, you know, something that over the past few years for me it was a big realization. And I mean, saying it sounds almost kind of silly, like obvious, but how, you know, really we ignore the Christian influence on a lot of Western philosophers that are incredibly, uh, oh, yeah, you know, like they, they might be atheists or whatever. And I think this goes even for Marxism itself. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, and 
when I grew up in an area of uh, the southern U.S. that was very strictly like fundamentalist religious, and I never was, and I kind of had like a a backlash against it, and in my early teens was like enthralled with new atheism and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, I was reading, you know, starting to read uh, postmodern philosophy and Marxism and stuff, and gaining insight through that, and you know, I would have really pushed back on the idea that, you know, all that stuff was actually an outgrowth of, yes. uh, you know, Christian society and um, thought. So, yeah, but by saying, you're right, like Islamic thinker, it does um, kind of negate the fact that, oh, yeah, well, these people, all these like French intellectuals, <laughs> you know, as atheistic as they may have be, were actually probably Christian thinkers in some sort. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and I think the um, there's, and th this is a very interesting uh, concept for me as well, as you say, to find um, lineage and genealogies and people's thinkings. And I think Foucault was really good at that, to kind of analyze where does that thought come from. Um, an example I, I, I was, I, I, that hit me quite hard was um, uh, atheism in Iran. So there was uh, this person, or groups of people who come forth and denounce religion, they themselves often had a religious background or were um, sons of uh, priests. And what analysts and um, theorists often notice is the fact that all that really happened to them was that they ch the ideas changed, but they still spoke from a pulpit. And so they never engaged in any kind of dialectical discussion. They never really answered. It was, it was almost as if the form, going back to form and content, the form was exactly the same. The content just had changed. And um, I think that, again, is when you look at a lot of philosophers, I think the idea of like uh, uh, form is always, always incredibly interesting. To, uh, to look at to see what influenced the way they presented information even when the information was different oh and i wanted to say another thing about translation because I, I, I thought that was interesting what you said um because may, maybe i'm wrong about this uh but i remember reading it's been a while since i read edward said uh but i remember him speaking of there not being an islam but islams um i mean which makes, I mean, complete sense if you think about it for even a second, because the same as with any religion, that religions are internally diverse. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the interesting factors, or something that really struck out to me when reading about Islam was this idea of the Quran being a text that is actually maybe even more important, the spoken version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, that any translation can only be an interpretation mm. of that and you know i think that can sometimes be seen as like silly by westerners like especially the more jaded or nihilistic kind of being like okay yeah that's so special but that's really most text any text that has actual mm. thought put into it like you were saying if you're going to translate it you're really interpreting it and you know walter benjamin talked a lot about that as well like the act of interpretation is a part and an art all in and of itself. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is, it opens the gateway to so many very, very uh, difficult conversations. There's um, uh, one, of, one of the one of the points that it brings up is the concept of lines of boundaries and borders, right? So the question comes, as you say, the multiplicity of religion, the various faces upon which it can take because as you say, a, Mus a, a Muslim in Morocco, is going to be very different to a Muslim in Bangladesh. They're both Muslims, but the cultural elements and the way they interpret things is going to be worlds apart. But then the counter argument to that often is 
there has to be a core or there has to be a thing that means that they're Muslim because otherwise anyone can claim it to which the response is well why shouldn't anyone be able to claim it you know what what is what is the authority here that dictates the boundaries and lines between what is and what isn't who should be who shouldn't be and I think a lot of arguments is based on these lines and borders when someone even even in the discussion of um for example people who are in the current situation people who deny the covid vaccine that say no such thing exists right or that no, no covid doesn't exist sorry so you would say okay but you know the scientific facts tell us that x y z and no, no, no. and it's like well what's the line between skepticism and uh, authority essentially because the scientific community says that there's a particular uh, virus going on there's certain things happening and other groups are saying well it's a post-truth world it, this is my epistemic view this is how i uh, uh, this is my lived experience and this is how i interpret things and again there's a line that's drawn between what is lived experience what is fact authority multiplicity and again a lot of these conversations for me anyway, it's between lines, boundaries and lines between what is acceptable, what is, accept- what is unacceptable, what is truth, what is not. And um, just kind of circling back to the um, Quran, that's exactly it, it's one book. Many different narrations, are, not narrations, that isn't correct, many different uh, interpretations of it and uh, various ways in which it is spoken into reality and spoken into existence. There are those who are incredibly orthodox and there are those who are mystics uh, and again those those lines boundaries it all comes through you just reminded me i know a couple people there's a small community where i live in florida that can consider themselves quran only muslims and i had never heard of that and so they they basically reject the the hadith mm-hmm. and it was interesting talking to them and they told me that there are it's actually a large movement but people won't admit to it basically or that's their belief yeah. because they are shunned from you know unless they can find a certain community it's largely disagreed with yeah. so yeah i think that i just I, I don't know if you want to comment on that but i thought that was interesting learning about that myself that so what is there what is that core there because they maintain that they're part of the core and then i know there's people that say they don't fully fit into that center yeah so the inside and outside is always blurry absolutely. Well. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and uh yeah that's that's a lot of arguments isn't it it's like um there's an illusion of similarity i often find so someone will be like well i'm a catholic for example right and they would argue that they are uh, that it's a cohesive sect Catholicism is a, is a cohesive kind of identity or, or, or being. I always remember this, this, this notion that, you know, even within a family, two siblings could be from two different planets. And yet, because of the fact that they have the same family name, they're under one umbrella. And these are two individuals that may believe exactly the same thing, but interpret from two different sides of the, sides of the equation. And even with, as you say, it's, it's like, well, we're a Quran-only sect. And even within that Quran-only sect, I promise you there are divisions, <laughs> debates, and arguments that probably have so much similarity to other sects that they don't even know about. And I think that it, it can be quite scary because then you say, well, again, what is, where does that line and border uh, or boundary lie? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a toughie. Yeah, I I have um, an uncle who is a Catholic and thinks the Pope is actually an agent of Satan. So I, there you know, there we go. There we go. There we go. We're, we're, and who who really is going to tell him that you're not a Catholic? <laughs> yeah. So oh. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so moving on a little bit, you know, in our we've been doing the Beyond Linguistics reading groups, and we started with. Uh, Communist Manifesto, we did Dialectic of Enlightenment, and then we did the three um, major works by Mark Fisher. And 
in two of them, he kind of critiques hip hop uh, fairly hard. And as a hip hop fan myself, uh, though I do tend to like the less commercial hip hop, maybe because of like what we were saying earlier with some of the content of it. Um, I do, I like some commercial hip hop by all means. Uh, I'm not, a, I don't think I'm a snob, um, but I do tend to like a lot of like arty music, uh, avant-garde stuff, um, you know, the indie hip hop. But I, I did find some of his critiques uh, actually pretty insightful. And when we're in that group, we make memes out of what we're reading while we discuss them. We post the memes online and stuff. And I was actually kind of a little surprised. Uh, we got a good bit of pushback from the Fisher memes concerning hip hop. Um, like at best, people would say, ah, this is just Fisher being a boomer. Like, ah, kids today with their music. Uh, but then we got a fair amount of like people saying, no, I think he's actively being racist here. Um, and I know your love of hip hop, like we've discussed, isn't just like this, the political and social connection, but the music as a whole, uh, the whole culture of it. And so I kind of wanted to go through this with you and just read a couple things and kind of get your reaction to them and see what you think of Fisher's analysis there. Um, so the first thing, you know, he actually does seem to praise like early hip hop and socially conscious rap. He says good stuff about like Sugar Hill Gang and stuff like that, about the utopian surrealism that you can find in freestyles and ciphers, um, as well as like the way that it's able to document the ignored reality of inner city life. And he cites um, The Message by Grandmaster Flash and The Furious Five, um, or the works of Public Enemy. But he then says that gangster rap, on the other hand, neither creates a criminality like the conservative critics want to push on it, um, but also that it doesn't merely reflect a reality like its defenders claim. He calls capitalist realism this anti-myth myth. It's like a myth that claims to get rid of sentimentality and other types of myths, and it embraces what is real. And that often amounts to like a really hardened view of the world and kind of like links that to the notion of keeping it real and authenticity and street culture in gangster rap and their affinity towards like Godfather and Scarface. And like, so yeah, it kind of shows how the birth of gangster rap is pushed by a corporate agenda as well at the same time as the rise of Reaganism and neoliberalism. If I get any of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think the one of the things about um... Fisher that I found interesting in terms of hip hop was the keep it real part. Um, Saul Williams, the fantastic poet, has a song called uh, Coded Language. And the line he says, says, statements such as keep it real usually have a um, connotation for violence. You know, you're someone might be, you know, chickening out or fighting and you're like, keep it real man we have to we have to do what we have to do and that dictates reality essentially you're saying that this is um the, the line he not in coded language but in another poem he says a father comes over and changes his child's um uh, the tv the cartoons he's watching to the news and the news is all about bloodshed and he says, that's real. That's the reality. And so Williams's question is, man telling his son about war and a purple dinosaur talking about love, which one is keeping it real, right? And it's an interesting question with regards to keeping it real is, for me anyway, it's changing. Like, um, again, to, going to tip up a butterfly, you have a song like You, for example, where he's completely vulnerable he's crying he's weeping on the song today that notion is real the person's keeping it real by not lying but by being honest by being vulnerable by expressing their subjectivities in a way that they normally wouldn't be able to outside of music or they might you know it's quite a big thing to, to give to an audience of millions of people and just lay yourself there and that is real you know today that that's seen as being real whereas a couple of years ago 
reality or keeping it real. As, as Fisher says, it would be uh, 50 cents, uh, hates it or love it. Where he says, um, um, you know, we don't have to pretend the cold world over here is full of pressure and pain. And that becomes reality. And that was, that was seen as real. But for me anyway, it is changing. But that's because the, of the context. So I disagree with, with um, Fisher in that it doesn't come from a context for me. It can't exactly comes from a context. context. The reason why Scarface is a figure, the reason why Trump is, was a figure in her book, the reason why these, these, these figures are so big is because it's about, it's about making it in a way that is outside of the expected, which the individuals are denied from in the first place. Going to an avenue, for example, and saying, you know, at school, I was called stupid. At school, I was denied this, I was denied that. But I'm going to make it anyway out of my own machismo. And this is, this is what it brings out. Those realities create raps. They create, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, no, you have to rap about something else. You have to come at, you have to come at it from a different angle, which is what struck. That, that was my main critique of Fisher, was when he criticized grime as skunk smoking hyper-masculinity. Um, and that was very odd, mainly because, you know, the, uh, it's a very specific subculture, you know, and um, I guess uh, f- f- I understand where he's coming from, but um, I think one always have to, has to be careful and acknowledge the fact that this is, pri- this is fundamentally a black art form. You know, hip hop is in the same way Taekwondo is a Korean martial art. This is a black art form, and any kind of uh, any reflections on it has to keep, keep has to keep that into consideration. It can't be an a historical view of something. Well, in in Ghost of My Life, Fisher talks about Kanye and Drake, and I'll read the quote here. He says, um, "Drake and Kanye West are both morbidly fixated on exploring the miserable hollowness at the core of super affluent hedonism." No longer motivated by hip-hop's drive to conspicuously consume, they long ago acquired anything they could have wanted. Drake and West instead dissolutely cycle through easily available pleasures, feeling a combination of frustration, anger, and self-distrust, aware that something is missing, but unsure exactly what it is. So in there, there's like kind of that touching on that way that keeping it real is changing, that actual incorporation of emotions into songs though i think he's ultimately skeptical there of some of those emotions being just uh maybe a mask for something else or um not not longing for it maybe hard enough i think the when i read that by fisher the one thing i remembered was um the unbearable lightness of being uh, and there's a quote in there that says, if you live in lightness, your actions are insignificant, basically. But if you have a burden, it grounds you. And I think that's exactly the, the melodies, the way that it's so light, you know. And this is where you have um, Kanye West supporting Trump, for example, recently. It's this Joker character. It's someone who, you know, just flip-flops and there's no grounding. And when you don't have that grounding, your thoughts are insignificant. They're just sporadic. And so there's no, um, there's no, nothing that, um, that matters anymore. And I think a lot of their rhymes are based on that fact, is the fact that it's woe unto me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm, I'm so successful, no one understands this, ra, ta, 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 ta. because there's nothing there to navigate them towards something. Um, like, Immortal Technique, for example, again, I, I bring him up. You know, he's built an orphanage in Afghanistan. You know, he's, he's, he's constantly relating his existence and his efforts to realities. And that's why you'll never hear anything about woe unto me from someone like him. It is simply because the realities are completely different. And someone like Drake O'Connor can do that a million times over. But it is the fog of that lightness that they are not willing to give up any of the, I sound like a fucking dick, but they're not willing to give up their, uh, their freedoms to actually do something about it. 
And I think that's the consequence of it. It's lightness. It's not having any um, anything to ground you to the world. That makes me think also someone I've never really cared for their music, but Akon. Um, I know he did a lot of stuff like um, yeah, installing. Yeah. What's that? Big time in Africa. Yeah, yeah. Um, big time. And that's not someone whose music I really care for at all. But I find that incredible, like that amount of care and, you know, doing stuff that's, you know, you could you could say it's charity, but I would say it's beyond charity, um, you know, setting up sustainability and the ability <laughs> for people to thrive, you know, not just like, you know, it's not the um, Billy, the easy yeah, thing to do. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, and from, like I said, I'm, I've never been a big fan of his music, but from what I remember, uh, he is someone that would still have woe, um, but not about that necessarily, no. you know, and I, I think that kind of makes it maybe more grounded because, you know, you can have heartache um, even if you're financially stable. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But and again, that, sometimes it comes off wrong. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think that's what um, that's the creative license that Drake has, right? Is that he's so good at articulating that kind of heartache that people give him that creative license of like, okay, you can you can you can talk about it. You can uh, uh, this is something that we can that we can resonate with. You know. In the K-Punk collection, the the big thick book from Fisher, or you can find it online. His blog was K-Punk. He did a review of a Drake album, Nothing Was the Same. And I actually think that review is better than the section in Ghost of My Life. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from that, too, because he kind of kicks up his critique there, but goes against it. He says, uh, Drake confirms that the street strutting bad boy, quote, just looking for a head in a comfortable bed, end quote, is the other face of the desperately alone little boy lost crying to his mommy substitute. The boasting brood is always on the run from the helpless infant inside. But for that very reason, the emotionally broken down male isn't an alternative to the ego armor posturing so much as it is enabling condition. Women are to be publicly disdained, treated as currency in a homosocial bragging economy, and in private, they are asked to make these men whole again. But Fisher doesn't really only have negative stuff to say about Drake there. He kind of ends the review by saying that the album isn't only an observation of present deadlock, but that you can hear a longing for something new, a wanting to get past that deadlock. Uh, getting to this point, he kind of makes what I think is the strongest observation uh, on Drake and hip hop. And he's speaking of contemporary versions of masculinity. He says, Drake is at his weakest when he's half-heartedly attempts some kitschy hallmark love card affirmation of love. He's at his most painfully revelatory when he admits that these impasses, these binds, are just too much for him. He can't escape these knots because these knots are what he is. His bewilderment about what a man is is supposed to is supposed to be now is the very hallmark of contemporary heterosexual masculinity that realizes the patriarchal game is up, but which is also hooked on the pleasures and privileges to relinquish them. It's just, just one more click on porn and then I'll be Mr. Sensitive forever. And so like, given that you have several videos addressing concepts of masculinity, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on Fisher's remarks there. And I guess it would be nice to add, that is a particular contemporary uh, masculinity, probably found in the UK, America, Canada, you know, um, not all over. So, yeah, what do you think of those remarks? And like, especially in relation to hip hop, is is there that general macho attitude still in hip hop? Is, is it like inherently misogynic? But how has it changed since those earlier days? And um is there anything in Iranian and Persian hip hop that is different, like that has a counterpart to the Western conception of women through hip hop? I definitely don't think hip hop is inherently misogynistic. I would even say that um, with reference to your question of Iranian hip hop and views on women, my kind of first contact with feminism was through Iranian hip hop. There was a song by an artist called Shahin Najafi who 
but had a song, it was the first ever song called Ma Marit Nistim, which means we are not men. And um, the, the last line of the song goes, masculinity has killed us, at least you be a woman. And it's basically this idea that um, uh, there's a lot of boast, essentially, there's a lot of machoism, but it's hollow. At the end of it, it's just uh, oppression, it's exploitation, it's repression. And in terms of uh, Fisher's uh, response that I think a lot of masculinity in general is, again, just it, there's a historical component there. I think when we look at, um, there's a really, really good book called Playboys in Paradise by Oscar B. And what it talks about essentially is that before World War I, um, your sense of masculinity was based on how much work you did. So you never ever wear nice things because that was a bit silly. It was, it was about how productive you are. And then after the kind of economic boom post World War II, there was suddenly a duality there where production accompanied consumption. And so there was a need to consume to kind of bolster up productivity. And that's where you have Playboy. And that's where you have the first time in which men are seen in tuxedos and martinis. And suddenly there's this shift where the more you consume, the bigger man you are essentially. It's not about, so, and even, even in like gangster movies, you see how very well dressed they are. You know, that wasn't necessarily a thing. It's a very contextualized recent thing that um, you have this element of, I can consume, therefore I am worth something. But part of consumption is there's a certain element of narcissism there that's usually associated with the feminine or being feminine. And um, I think uh, here in this particular context that you're talking about, you have someone like Drake where you have people who have precisely this kind of um, idea that I can be um, this incredibly sensitive person. But at the same time, if you look at the way that they produce and how they consume, it's still on patriarchal norms that they do so. They still, the sense of masculinity still comes from this, how much you have. It's still very much uh, objectifying women or seeing them as objects and how many you can collect how many notches on the belt so to speak and parts of that vulnerability aspect to it we have to also understand that again we live in a time where there's this a lot of things that are ne unnecessary for a certain type of masculinity don't exist anymore and this is uh, uh, how would you say it? Um, it's called the calluses on the hands. Ones that one used, used to expect, you know, the farmer or the tractor driver to have a hand but a callus. Whereas now the necessity for that is slowly declining. We're going into post work essentially. And a lot of various forms of uh, activity and work are changing. And that definitely shifts gender relations. It shifts what it means to be a male, it, what performances one produces. There's often that very interesting caricature of the individual wearing the lumberjack um, shirt with a pipe, big beard, and uh, very big muscles. But chances are they're a graphic designer, you know, the chances are that they've never chopped wood in their life. But these images are still very much trying to put, push that that image now, even though it doesn't contend with anything in reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if that answered any of your questions. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. So immediately, I think that, you know, the callus on the hands is an interesting one because that's still a common insult, uh, like a masculine insult to, to say someone has soft hands. Exactly. Um, and yeah, and it doesn't even matter. Like it could be someone that you've never met at all you have no idea what their hands are like but it is meant as a signifier is that they're feminine yeah. um, 
you know. And likewise, the uh, there's a right wing meme that you can see. It was popular probably about two years ago. I saw it all the time, and it was exactly that person you were describing with the big beard wearing a you know a flannel shirt looking like a lumberjack and it would say like if you look like this and you don't know how to change a tire you need to shave your beard <laughs> <laughs> um as if yeah as if there was that connection there but it's the same kind of thing because and in that one it's almost it's like they want to keep that signifier of yeah, exactly. masculinity <laughs> um, but, yeah. but again i mean in 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 uh, again this this goes to theories of gender abolitionism, but a lot of mater the material conditions that exist and the technological advances that are being made, a lot of these um, traditional gender norms are things that are keeping us behind. They're things that if we attach to them too much, we're not able to reach um, certain potential in terms of uh, uh, human enjoyment, you know, the unnecessary suffering that comes from this masculinized view of reality that is that there has to be um uh, something to suffer for essentially and i mean i i have quite a large beard and i can't change a tire but i can't do most of those things that the hyper masculinists would want me to do um nor do i have any desire to that reminds me though as well we were speaking on instagram just the other day about patriarchy and capitalism mm -hmm. and the uh, the way they were intertwined there. Do you have anything you would like to say on that? Like uh, how how they interact? Um, or, so I guess I'll, I'll frame it is our, our conversation was basically how you could get rid of capitalism and we still have to deal with patriarchy, that there's still oppression there. There has to, for any counteraction of that point, you have to show a communist society that's void of patriarchy. I don't think that's possible. I think it's it's, it's um, if if uh, misogyny and patriarchy existed before capitalism, it means that it is not dependent. It's if 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 cap if capitalism produced patriarchy, then yeah, sure you could you could make that argument. But to say that, for example, in a in a there'll be a revolution tomorrow and afterwards there'll be no patriarchy, I'm I'm really interested in hearing an argument about that. Um, there may be a really good one, but I have yet to come across an argument that says that they are so intertwined that the getting rid of one will eventually uh, get rid of the other. I don't think they're codependent on that level, although I do agree that capitalism requires certain patriarchal norms and it involves patriarchy in a certain way. Yeah, I, I do think there's changing changes there uh, that are interesting and hard to parse out you know i mean i guess like the joke uh now is about like female drone pilots and stuff like that where you have a certain like liberal version of what yeah. what yeah. feminism might be which is like just allowing women into the very seats of exploitation and that wouldn't change very much um there has to be a multi-front dismantling of both i think and so like one of the one of the big right wing narratives over the past decade has been this uh, feminization of men. And you talked about this in your video about Freud and Marcuse. And you also wrote an article out there uh, for the Muslim vibe titled The Crisis of Masculinity, a Western Fiction. Could you go over this fear a little bit and tell us a why it's a fiction? Um, and what Western views on Islamic society have to do with this? Because that was actually surprising to me. I, I wasn't aware of that, of what you laid out in there, but after reading it, I was able to see it. And do you see any positive developments in contemporary masculinity, uh, or do we need to like kind of move away from concepts of masculinity altogether? Absolutely. I, I, I have, I'm generally a gender abolitionist. I think that it, holds being signified in a particular way holds back potentials for existence it's it, i don't i i it's quite a, a, a how do you say it? some people will call it utopian because the, there's this idea that it will never actually happen because the actual process is going to take so long however 
I just look at when I was a teenager in London and the differences between teenagers now and teenagers then, and it's massive. It is absolutely huge, the, uh, the way in which people, people's thinking has changed on, on a variety of issues. So no, I don't, I don't think it's utopian at all. I think, um, I think the damage that um, patriarchal gender relations produce are real. They destroy relationships, they destroy people, and um, they ruin lives. It is, it is unnecessary suffering, which goes to the um, Marcuse argument, which is that Freud's um, civilization and discontent intertwines civilization and repression. And the human is basically just looking to <laughs> for lust and for desires, basically. And that if there is not a repression of that, then we die. There has to be, uh, in order for civilization to thrive, there has to be repression of the instincts, which is fair enough. Marcuse comes around and says, well, if you look at, for example, the 1950s to the 2000s, the rate of change that's happened in those 50 years is equal to 100 years prior. And which means that the general shift. So uh, we existed before Google. And now they're talking about AI. Now they're talking about all of these various things that, but we're raised because human time is quite, uh, is different to that kind of exponential growth. There's a lag essentially. So say for example, if you were born in the sixties, your father might have been in the military and might have, pardon my language, but seen some shit. And if that's going to be the case, then you're going to be raised in a way from someone who's seen some things that you may never see in your life. But the type of upbringing that you've had is in relation to a reality that you don't exist within. And that is exactly the problem we have with a lot of masculine norms at the moment. At a certain time, if you didn't chop wood, you would die. Today, that is not the case. And if that is not the case, it means that a lot of repressions that are put on us in order for us to be able to survive in that context are outdated. They produce more suffering than necessary. The line of what is, um, what is necessary or is not necessary is a different discussion, but one would argue that, and this is again why a lot of uh, right-wing ideologies are constantly going on about war because that's what they want to produce. They want to produce soldiers. They want to produce people who are ready to beat some people up because there has to be this fear of attack on a person to produce that kind of response from them. And it's completely outdated. And it's unfortunate that a lot of, um, a lot of other parts of the world have taken on this narrative, which is not theirs. Um, another example of this is um, we have this notion of, the Muslim world as being authoritarian and illiberal when it comes to sex and sexuality. If one takes a look at the genealogy of uh, sexual studies, for example, you see that there was a shift in the Islamic world post-colonialism, where Victorian ideas of sexuality were imposed. And then suddenly there is a shift in tonality, there's a shift in this idea of what is acceptable, what is unacceptable. Do we talk about sex? Do we not talk about sex? Whereas in that particular time period, erotology, which is the study of eros or uh, sexuality and desire in general, and the erotic was rife in the Islamic world and people were talking about sex very open. And yet today in this particular world that we live in, there's a certain view of the Islamic world as prudish, frigid. And it's actually the West that's liberal. And, uh, but again, it's an ahistorical view. And it's strange that a lot of Muslims themselves are taking on a lot of these right-wing narratives that, yes, there's a war going on, we need to be offensive, blah, blah, blah. and it's a reproduction of a very ugly cycle. Yeah, it was just this idea that um, uh, humans have changed. 
you know, uh, and will continue to change. And there are those who want to negotiate for there to be restrictions on that change. And there are those who say, <laughs> what, why, where is the limitation on experimentation on this? You know, why is there... And, and again, always throughout history, when one, when one looks at these things, there's always the notion that should the thing be questioned, everything's going to crumble. So when um, the argument for not giving women the vote was this idea that if women were to come into the democratic process, civilization would collapse. Lo and behold, no such thing has happened. And this is uh, always the case of authority in a sense that if you question it, everything will fall, not just the authority itself. And um, yeah, again, it's, it's um, for me, it's a question of technology. At what point do you say this is necessary, this is necessity, and how is it, or is it contingent? And I think the question of technology always leads it to contingency rather than necessity. Absolutely. Um, well, I very much appreciate you talking today. Uh, I highly recommend for people to check out your YouTube channel. I absolutely love it. I love the work that you're doing. Um, it's highly engaging. You know, like I said at the beginning, uh, hip hop philosophy, some essays kind of mixed in there. And it's beautiful stuff too. You know, you're mixing like digital editing with uh, cut and paste collage it's unique you don't see that kind of effort put into videos all that often anymore uh, a lot of them are stock footages you know and that's it with a narration over it so it's good to see that and hopefully it hits people in the head and the heart is there anything you would like to uh, plug a specific video or any other thing you want to specifically talk about before we head off um, at this very moment in time I'm currently working on uh the video for Gramsci called Hegemony, which deals with um, the uh, what's happening in Palestine at the moment. Please do check it out if you're listening to this right now. And I just like to finalize by saying I really appreciate you um, having me on your show. Uh, I love the work you do, and thank you so much to anyone who's listening. All right, thank you. That's Art and Salimi. This is the Acid Left Podcast. Simulator. Reproducible to infinity. Now, all this sounds wild, crazy, and I don't want it to sound wild and crazy. I want it to sound the way that I think that it, it really should sound. There is a postmodern trajectory. I am from another world. Politics becomes images. Reagan smile while villages burn with the burn is irrelevant. The real becomes a pint and a cigarette Since the sign is everywhere The system braids it in its hair With no resistance Medusa takes snakes on fangs the venom Give you back an image and a stone cerebellum Revolution, clock misfortune and war Superseded by love and care for the poor It's all aesthetics, nobody coming Waiting for the drop but there's no beat running Support live aid, shed tears in mourning Still turn up to work on Monday morning That's the threat Politics dead, no return, alienation burn. The futility of everything that comes to us from the media is the inescapable consequence of the absolute inability of that particular stage to remain silent. Music, commercial breaks, news flashes, adverts, news broadcasts, movies, presenters, there's no alternative but to fill the screen. Otherwise, would be an irremediable void. That's why the slightest technical hitch, the slightest slip on the part of the presenter becomes so exciting, for it reveals the depth of the emptiness squinting out at us through this little window. If you have been enjoying our content, please consider registering your desire with the algorithm by liking and subscribing. This really does help us grow and reach a wider community.
If you would like to support our work of documenting and nurturing the rise of post-capitalist desires, become a patron. This allows us to continue research-based memes, podcasts, and videos, as well as up our production value. Patrons receive early views of videos, exclusive content, and more, including physical art and the ability to directly influence our research topics. The building of a better world happens on many fronts. Turn on, tune in, and shape a future collective reality.